Hey, what's going on, everybody? Obstacles, the opportunity for another one when everyone hates Tesla. Dealership or dealership, Tesla changes the process. Now, we don't know if we could call it a dealership or a dealership, but what we do know is that the model is pretty old. Now, no disrespect for the methods of how actually cars are sold to people today, but net net, we found a new way at Tesla. And these are one of the many things that Tesla, Elon Musk, and everybody at the company has found a way to change the game. Now, we don't call them dealerships, but we call them showrooms. And people are allowed to come to the showroom and start the process, okay? And it's just like purchasing an iPhone. It's just like purchasing a pair of tennis shoes. And you don't have to deal with, let's say, the car's salesman or woman actually raking margin on top of you, attempting to make a profit for themselves. So what I want to show you guys is the history of it and how it's different and how, once again, Tesla does many things, but we always end up changing the game. Let's get into it. What's up, everyone? You know, most people would agree that buying a car in the U.S. is not the ideal shopping experience. I mean, before you even get to a dealership, it's essential that you research and prepare yourself just to make sure you're not getting ripped off. Not only that, when it comes to things like pricing, everybody gets a different price, and unfortunately, there's no return policy. Unlike, say, buying an iPhone or a pair of Nikes, you don't get to pick how you buy your car. It has to be done at a third-party dealership, which is a store that is not owned by a manufacturer. This, unfortunately, is the law. As someone who used to sell cars, I could tell right away that people really didn't trust car salesmen, and they have every right not to. Dealerships use many tactics to make as much money as Okay, hold on. Let's check out a couple of those tactics there. Common ways car dealers rip customers off. Now, I'm not going to say all that, but I'm just going to say one of the ways in which they make money. All right. So they devalue and underpay for a trade in. Okay. So when you want to trade in your car, they're going to give you an undervalue. Okay. Here we go. Number two, over overcharge for a car. Okay. That's number two. Number three is overcharge for additional warranties, GAP services, contracts, and et cetera. That's another way that they actually accumulate money. And number four, add unwanted accessories. Okay, I think you have a choice, but yeah, a lot of people get got. Number five, sell unnecessary products such as third-party alarms, rust protection, paint sailing, and etc. Again, those are your choices, right? Number six, charge additional fees. Number seven, inflate your approved interest rate. A lot of them act as an intermediate when it comes down to interest rates, they might get it from the bank and then they might raise it by a percentage point or so and then give you a different interest rate than they got from the original source. Number eight, conceal all of the above by getting customers to focus on a monthly payment. And that happens with home purchases also. Normies are going to normie and they're not going to protect themselves. Now, I don't call this ripping your customers off, but I'll call this the way that they make money. I'm not anti capitalist. Okay, let's continue as they possibly can off of each customer. Unfortunately, salespeople and managers are usually incentivized with commission-based salaries that rely on executing these strategies. The only exception to the rule is Tesla, which is the only manufacturer that owns and operates its stores. More on why later, but this has actually allowed Tesla to deliver a buying experience that's far better than any dealership. However, manufacturer-only stores are still not ideal for consumers. Tesla is still struggling with things like customer service and vehicle service, and at the end of each quarter, they rely on help from other departments and even customers to deliver new cars to reach their sales quotas. Having additional third-party retailers would really have helped here. I mean, look at how busy Apple stores are. Imagine how tough it would be for them if they didn't have other retailers like AT&T or Best Buy helping them sell iPhones. Well, an iPhone is considerably different than selling a whole car, okay? <laughs> so it's a bad comparison, but I get it, but still bad. Still a terrible way to compare it. In the end, customers should have the right to choose how they buy their car, whether it's in-store, online, from a manufacturer, or from a dealership. However, it just isn't this way, and the reason why is because it's kind of a gray area. You see, nobody likes car dealerships, but there's actually a pretty decent argument that warrants their protection. In the early days of the automotive boom in the US, dealers played a very important role in the success of today's car companies. Instead of manufacturers risking their capital to open up stores from New York to the island of Kauai, they let other people take on the risk by investing their personal money to become franchise owners. This allowed- See, so it always makes sense once you go back a little bit and observe the history, and then you look at the development phase of that industry, right? Cars is a new technology. And so net-net, that's how it allowed actually the manufacturer not to take all of the risk. 
But now it's just time for a new innovation. This allowed manufacturers to simply focus on building better cars and ramping up production. In the end, this really helped manufacturers succeed and grow into some of the biggest companies in the world. Today, if they wanted to, they could easily open their stores and put car dealerships out of business. And this is exactly why franchise laws were put into place. The reason why Tesla was able to own and operate its own stores is because they never utilized car dealerships while growing and therefore never had any franchises to put out of business. Instead, and thanks to the internet, Tesla built small pop-up shops in high traffic locations like shopping malls and sold cars online. This allowed them to build each car to order so they didn't have to carry large inventories, which is pretty expensive. Also, too, why we call them showrooms, not necessarily sale or dealerships. We don't call them dealerships. All right. So you can go there, check it out, get a test drive, place in your order online. But net net, you really don't deal with it right then and there. This has been a pretty big threat to the dealer industry, but it's turned out to be a pretty nice advantage for Tesla. Dealerships and many manufacturers, including General Motors, have lobbied against Tesla's direct sales model because they know that there are many advantages and they want to be able to have a level playing field. Not true. They're just doing it because it fits their best interests, and that's all it is. After all, owning the sales operation has many advantages. Unlike dealerships, Tesla is the employer, so they get to pick who sells and services their cars, as well as who manages the stores, as well as how much everyone is paid. See, setting in a standard across the board, making a purchase pretty easy. And so there's pros and cons for both systems. But if it's a free market, both should be allowed. Everyone is paid. For other manufacturers, when it comes to things like online sales, unfortunately, they're at the mercy of other dealerships. Every single dealership has their own website, which all looks terrible. And I don't know of any dealers that actually allow you to place an order. In fact, in almost all cases, you can't even get a final price without filling out a form and submitting an inquiry. And even then, sometimes dealers can be a little bit dodgy. So if you're Honda or BMW trying to compete with Tesla, using dealerships is a huge disadvantage. If manufacturers could take over the sales operation, they probably would. And in some cases, they've done unusual steps like opening up pop-up shops that can deliver a sales experience that meets their expectations. Take, for example, this Lincoln pop-up shop at Fashion Island Mall in Newport Beach. It is a beautiful store that is funded by Ford. The staff are knowledgeable, and they can actually take you on a real test drive rather than a drive around the block. However, you can't actually buy a car here because, again, that is illegal. Instead, they will refer you to a Lincoln dealership where you can actually complete your transaction. And this is why Elon made a great point. Once you create so many laws, laws need to be deleted. Because if you just continuously stack laws upon laws upon laws, then people just don't have the option to actually innovate and create. There's always these trip over laws. And now we got to innovate and create just to go around laws that exist. I think it's about time that we kind of change the game. I can't imagine it's cheap to operate a store at a high-end mall that doesn't even generate revenue, which is the complete opposite of what Tesla can do at their store, which is literally right around the corner. In the end, fixing the way we buy cars in the U.S. is not going to be easy. Car dealerships happen to be some of the biggest taxpayers in any given state, which gives them a strong voice against regulators. Also, while their size is small individually, combined, they actually happen to be pretty big and their size rivals those of the manufacturers. However, I think it's time for a change. I mean, consumers should have the right to choose how they buy a car, and manufacturers shouldn't be restricted from being able to sell cars directly to consumers. I would love to know what you guys think, so... I think you guys got no rights at the end of the day. I mean, it is what it is. <laughs> but net net, I do think that the free market needs to be reigning tight and allowing everybody to choose. Shout out to Sean, Sean Fair Use. So oh, we're going to give him a like. Of course, you always got to like these videos. That was a good, informative video, right? So. My opinion is definitely that's one of many things that Tesla always innovates. Congratulations to Elon Musk and the team. And we're going to go over this book. It's the power play Tesla, Elon Musk, and the bet of the century. And in this particular part about this book, you can go check it and get it on Amazon. Tim Higgins, they talk about this actual specific part. OK, now this is just a sample. We're going to show you some information. And so you can get an understanding of how people in the company always think and look to innovate. All right. More than just changing the kind of cars the auto industry sold, Musk was thinking about how vehicles were sold. So not only were we changing from ICE vehicles to EV vehicles, it's like, well, that's cool, but how are vehicles sold? Maybe we could make some change. He thought the car buying experience was ripe for a change. And he wanted Tesla to be able to take control of the experience. So they researched to backed up the concerns and months earlier, he had set or set across from Bill, who was a lifetime automotive 
experience or expert, basically, as an owner of a successful Mercedes dealership. As Tesla began exploring the complexities of the dealership model, S named had come up as somebody to seek out for advice. One of those juggernauts, right? Go seek him. He's the expert. And of course, if he's an expert, that means he's stuck in his ways. He had sought out the longtime Silicon Valley car dealer to learn more about the retail side of the auto industry. E, original business plan depended upon using select franchise dealerships in wealthy enclaves to sell their roaster. See, this was initial plan for Tesla. Places like Silicon Valley, Beverly Hills, probably New York City, and maybe even Miami. They wanted to use an exotic car dealership that already had experience with ultra expensive brands such as Bentley and Lotus. Remember, the early roaster was a Lotus, not an exact Lotus, but basically a build out of a Lotus. These dealers had skilled mechanics on staff accustomed to working on high end vehicles. They expected dealerships to mark the roadster up to about $80,000. 15,000 above what Tesla charged the stores. So you guys, you see the inconsistency? So now we complain about, you know, Tesla adding a couple thousand or taking off a couple thousand. But, you know, if you're dealing with the traditional how vehicles are sold, then you're getting charged 15,000 on top of it. Giving a dealer more than a normal gross margin. So this is more, maybe 10,000, maybe 7,000, still a lot, right? And thus plenty of incentive to do business with the startup company. That's what I'm going to say, not upstart. Automakers in the U.S. had long sold new cars through a network of third-party owned stores. These stores operated under franchise agreement contracts that spelled out in painful detail how each side would go about conducting its business. It was a system handed down from generation to generation, from the days of Henry Ford into the advent of mass manufacturing, and that largely benefited the manufactured who booked its sale of the car when it shipped to the dealer. Uh, the financial burden of selling that car to customers was solely on the dealership. So it was just kind of a transfer of responsibility, mitigating risk for the manufacturer, and then also putting the dealership into the supply chain and allowing them to make their own margins and grow out and expand the sale of these products, which were cars at this time. So again, this model back in the day is not a bad thing. Henry Ford was too busy scaling up factories, right? <laughs> he had a lot going on. And then he had to shift to World War II to make planes. So he had a lot going on. So no problem. Dealerships were good. I'm not here to get mad at him about what happened in the past. It was a system born out of the notion that a factory was most profitable when it was churning out as many cars as possible, allowing it to gain benefits of scale. But Ford Motor Company and didn't have the funds or the organization to open up stores in every city in America. So Ford grew its empire, not just on the wheels of the Model T, an affordable sedan, but on the backs of small business owners across the country who aimed to make their own fortunes selling the iPhone of its days, which was the Model T, guys. All right. Dealerships at first flourished as the new industry exploded, but they ran into trouble during the Great Depression. Of course, even Ford did, right? Ford couldn't have the factory idling. It would starve him of cash. And we don't want the factory to go down. That's the most important entity, not the dealerships. No disrespect. And so he not only aggressively pushed cars down the throats of the company's dealers, but the company underwent a dramatic expansion of its dealer network aiming to have stores on seemingly every street corner. So push the product even heavy, right? We don't want a backlog just because of this depression or recession. We want to push forward. Hmm, that's pretty ballsy, but shout out to Henry Ford. Ford had dealerships in a vice. And I'm pretty sure dealerships still took the bid. When a hundred years later, Starbucks found itself with too many stores exceeding customers' demand, the coffee maker could pull back with closures and bear in the financial brunt of it. But franchise car dealers were independently owned, leaving them with no recourse and a downturn. Yeah, you could just exit the business. You always got choices. If they were to pull back on their orders, the manufacturer could simply opt not to renew their contracts at year's end, leaving the store owner with an expensive investment and a little to salvage it. That's business, guys. That goes for real estate, almost anything. In the post-World War II era, Ford and GM got into the sales race, 
the push came from higher and higher volumes, forcing cars onto dealers who were forced in turn to push cars on customers. Guys, stop using all this force thing, all right? Make it everybody seem like a victim. <laughs> to avoid losing money on these sales, and dealers would offer heavy discounts. See, there you go. Hoping to make up for it elsewhere. All right, so the, you know, that's what it was. Either offering less money to customers who sought to trade in or charge more for financing practices that if done poorly, could leave a bad taste in customers' mouths. And this is just what's going to happen in any downturn, okay? You think Apple is going to let up? No, Apple is going to push in and go double down. And remember, Starbucks, <laughs> if they don't own the land, then the landlords are, are actually, you know, ending up in a predicament. You know, Starbucks can go into the situation and say, hey, look, we're having a rough time. We're not selling that much. So we either get a reduction on our rent so we can, you know, weather the storm or we leave. The landlords can cry and say they were forced into deals, but, you know, we just do business. You know, everybody takes a hit, so everybody's got to take a hit. After generations of perceived abuse, dealers began banding together in state houses across the country to find protection. In a small town, the owner of Chevy or Ford dealership might well be on one of the most successful local businessmen, providing jobs to many, paying for high-profile advertising, offering donations to charities and sport leagues, Sometimes these dealers were also members of their respective state legislators. Consequently, laws and regulations begin appearing across the country. Some aim to limit where manufacturers put stores, while others aim to ensure that the car manufacturer couldn't sell directly to customers. So see what one one second Henry Ford and GM were accused of, let's say, meddling in the affairs of the dealers. Right. Not being fair. Next thing you know, dealers come together and do the same thing, right? Pay for turkeys, hand out turkeys like it's New Jack City, do a couple charities, insulate themselves in legislative government positions, and start passing legislation so they can monopolize the industry. See? So one minute they were victims, and now the victimizers. I'm not saying that, but going off the basis of this read. By the turn of the century, an uneasy had been reached. The truth was that each side needed the other. Good. But like any system built over, up over 100 years, it was getting old and it was complex. By the very nature of the relationship, there was tension. Many of the dealers viewed themselves as independent, self-made, feeling that they should be able to run their stores as they saw fit. Car makers saw it differently, wanting to impose control as if they own each franchise location while they do own the product. So it makes sense. They're shifting back and forth. GM and its Chevy customers to have uniform experience across the brand, an image that automaker was spending billions to create through its products and marketing. Lost in all of this was the customer for most of whom the car buying experience was only slightly more appealing than a trip to the dentist. So it was not fun. And everybody kind of feels that way even today, possibly. Sitting with S-E, S &E, uh, listen as a longtime car dealer consulted him on why he needed to work with franchisees. See, the juggernaut comes in and says, you just need to comply. Who he said would serve as a face of Tesla brand to buyers. And an S had made a fortune selling cars like Mercedes. And so he wanted, or he was admittedly biased. So, see, he was biased at the end of the day, okay? He did caution E that some dealers were shady. And then he said, okay, if they're shady, which dealers did he trust? And then he got quiet and looked at the table and said, none. <laughs> so he said some, but then he said, okay, point out the ones that are trustworthy. And then the dude came back and said, none. <laughs> so that's pretty funny. Sometimes people just be talking. Let's go to the bigger screen. Yeah, there we go. So he can trust none. So he reported back to the board and his meeting helped sway the board. Selling their car direct was the way to go. But Tesla would again be entering uncharted territory. Building an electric vehicle was one thing. It had been tried in some form or another for decades. Selling a car directly to a customer was simply unheard of. Love it. Love it, guys. And so, you know, I could continue for a little bit. You know, Elon Musk went on to find somebody, Simon, on the company's board. And, you know, he was a Harvard grad, 
former McKinsey consultant for with Silicon Valley, and he created a marketplace on eBay selling automotive cars, vehicles, in the marketplace. And the website was doing pretty well, and it was generating $14 billion a year in sales, representing one-third of the company's overall merchandise. And so he was brought to the board to bring a perspective on selling cars, unlike that of many auto industries. So find the personnel. Again, everything's not about Elon Musk, right? It's about the people he could find. And this guy in particular had something that was not traditional. And see, they brought in the experts that were traditional, and all they told him was is to conform. But let's bring in somebody who innovated slightly for that time. And for a guy who created a you know, an online sales platform for vehicles on eBay. That sounds like somebody to bring into the fold. And so they brought them in there. They debated if they needed physical stores to sell the road store online, but they went back and they needed a sales team to walk customers through charging and everything because Elon wanted to go all in online. But they were like, yo, we just can't do that. We got to teach these guys. This is a brand new car. And so their lawyer advised them that Tesla could sell directly in California on a technicality the car maker had never had any franchise dealership and therefore it wouldn't be cutting into the franchisee sales so see there's always a way around right <laughs> so we got to be innovative on the technicality right we never had a franchise so we're not shutting down any franchise business so therefore we can sell directly to customers in california now other states have laws that are more complex and i think texas is one of them where you know they got to take the cars out, though they manufacture in Texas. They got to take it out of Texas and bring it back in on some crazy stuff because the rules um, are a little bit more strict and limited in Texas versus, you know, the technicality that was available in Florida. And that at least was an argument they'd be building off of. Now they just needed to figure out the rules for 49 other states. Can you believe that? 49 other states. All those different states have different rules that they had to figure out. But then that they figured it out in many ways. And this is why Tesla is amazing. This is another reason why you guys need to investigate, do your due diligence and research a company that you're thinking about investing in so that you can understand more than the price ticker, more than how the price fluctuates from year to date, year to year, five years. One week, 24 hours, 6%, and then last closing day. Like, you need to know more than that. You need to know about these fundamentals about how the company can innovate. How does it innovate? What was the process of the innovation? And is that embedded into the culture? And is that something that they continue to utilize? And if they do, then that makes them stand out against the Fords, the GMs, the Chryslers, and et cetera. You just got to realize that. First successful automotive company in 100 years in the United States is Tesla. Congratulations to everybody at Tesla. Thank you, Elon Musk, for always doing what you're doing, which is great. Always innovating and bringing in the right people to innovate. So, again, stop looking at Elon Musk only. And once you start digging into the company, you start seeing everybody else that allows him to execute the master plan. Like, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell for the future videos. I will see you guys on the next one. Go check out some other videos. I got a bunch of videos. Everyone hates Tesla. So go check those out. Get updated and figure out how you're going to be a part of the revolution. I appreciate you guys. Once again, thank you for subscribing, for being here every day with me. Everyone loves to hate Tesla. Everyone hates Tesla. Dealership or stealership? I don't know. I can't call it. But what I do know is when that roaster number two comes out, I'm going to be out here winning. Mines is driving that car. Have you seen that car, guys? That car is ridiculous. Shout out to the showroom in Dubai. This is how our showrooms look. Oh, they got the cyber truck out there on the screen. That's very interesting. Right? I know they ain't got it out in Dubai. Maybe they do. You know, those people be having money. So looking great. Looks sleek, looks way better than the most dealerships that you guys see across America. The website is amazing, easy to utilize. Go test drive a car today. I didn't say go buy it. Go test drive the car today and look at the bottom of it. 
Look at the bottom cast and look how simplistic the car is, right? So many pieces that go into a car and this is how we reduce all of that. And that one piece that you guys see is probably at least just two pieces of casting. The engineering is amazing when it comes down to this. The batteries are at the bottom. That's the powertrain, the wheels, everything. Like, there's nobody else beating us in these streets. I love it. I love it. And you get to see that when you're in the shop. That's why it's highest safety rating. That's why we're the best car out here. Model Y, looking amazing. Gray, I think this is the new one. So I think we got QR code. Go check it out. We got the QR code. You scan it. You get your information. Probably takes you straight online to seeing the price and all the information you got instead of those little old little pictures in the window where you're looking at it and you're like, what's the price? And it says, talk to the dealer. And you never get the price even on the car. Or maybe the price is on the car, but there's wiggle room to negotiate. Come on, man. It's crazy. Look how minimalist the vehicle inside interior design is. Look how sleek it is. I mean, this is where we're at. This is why this car was the number one selling car in the world. But let me get off my high horse. I said I'm in it. I'm going to get out of here. Dealership or dealership. You guys head down to the Tesla showroom now and go check out the car. Smell the inside.